So I'm with Robert Shrewsbury, who's one heck of a smart guy on a lot of different subjects, and one of them is is uh, one that I can't do, and Robert says he can teach me how to do it, and that's dowsing, and kind of tell me the, the theory behind it, and with that, Robert, hit it. Okay. Um, dowsing, some people have a gift, I've heard, and some don't, but most of it is, I would say, 90% of dowsing is the knowledge on how it works and how to deal with it. And that at that point, anybody or most people, if they want to practice and learn how to do it, can learn how to douse. Okay. And I was talking to Terry about the foundation of dowsing, which has a lot to do with polarity. Everything on earth that's an object has a north and a south pole. There are some things that have a neutral polarity. And it dominates the dowsing field, and I'll give you some examples of that. And I want to go into why dowsing works. For one, we have an electromagnetic field that goes around our body. Everybody does. That electromagnetic field works as a carrier wave. So if you focus on an object, your attention is on that object. And when you're dowsing, if that's something for something, if it's there, you'll pick it up. But if your attention is someplace else, while you're dowsing over here, you won't detect it. So it really depends on a lot of focus, the ability to focus. And I will demonstrate that. And I want to show you th these antennas. This is a North Pole antenna. This one is a South Pole antenna. This one is a neutral antenna. Okay. Now right here, I, have a, I want to show polarity. This is a magnet, okay? That red part is south pole. There's a magnet sitting across the way right there. Do you want me to set that magnet on this table? Yeah, you want me to hand it to you? Sure. And uh, It doesn't really matter the distance. You know, it can be close to you or it can be far away. Okay, there's the magnet. Hold on. Uh, okay. Hold on, hold on. Okay. That magnet right here is, oh, this side of it's the South Pole. The other side is a North Pole. Now, here is a South Pole magnet. I'll, south Pole will repel a South Pole. North Pole will repel a North Pole. Okay. okay so, I'm going to put my attention on that magnet, and then I'm going to sweep by. It takes a little bit, but I've got to keep my attention on it. It's repelling it. As you can see, huh. now it wouldn't repel at that distance, except it's piggybacking the aura, the electromagnetic aura around my body, and it follows my thoughts. So if I was to do this and, and put my attention over there on that bag, it wouldn't matter how many times at this distance that I did that, it wouldn't pick it up. But if I put my attention on that magnet for about 60, 30 seconds or less, not quite long enough, then it'll hit that field and you can see it's twisting it around, it's repelling it. So you mean, what do you do when you put your thought on it? Tell me what exactly you're doing. You just basically put your attention just, right to you it. You just think about it. You think about it, you have its mental image picture there, what you're looking for, you look at the object, and when your so thoughts you're visualizing it, you're, you're you're visualizing it, you're seeing it, and bingo, you'll hit it. Now I'm gonna change this a little bit, okay? I'm gonna do a different antenna. This is a South Pole antenna. Now I'm gonna use this instead. Sometimes if your two arms come together, it creates another force field, and your antenna doesn't work right. So I have an insulated tube here, and I just hold it against this. See, as it hits that south pole. Now I'm going to put my attention on the other side of the magnet, on the back side. Okay. And I'm going to put it there for a minute, or less, just a little bit. It, it won't repel. Because the back side of that magnet is North Pole. 
Now I'm going to put a north polarity magnet up, or antenna on. Now I'm going to put my attention on the back. Give it a little bit more time. Now it's repelling. Because north repels north. Now if I put my attention on the front part of the magnet, which is south pole, and this is north pole, attraction doesn't have near the power that repulsion does in dowsing. It doesn't. You have some power, but not as much. Now if I put it on the front part, there's no repulsion. That is a trace of attraction, but not repulsion, because repulsion is really powerful compared to attraction when you're dealing with magnetism or electromagnetic energy. So that's basically the basis, basis of dowsing. And what happens in dowsing, okay, so you have, let's say you're dowsing for silver, okay? Okay. Silver has a left-hand spin. Its nuclear spin is left or what they call down spin or left-hand spin, which means <coughs> it's south pole. Its dominant polarity is south. For that doesn't silver? mean that yeah, silver. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have North Pole in it, but its dominant polarity is South Pole. Now, so, so you have. So, so I, I hate to interrupt you. So I got to back you up. So I was confused when you say you got a North Pole dowser and a South Pole dowser. That's because you got magnets in that, or, or no? Do you mean it's North or South Pole. This is pure cotton. Cotton pulls North polarity from the ethers. You couldn't pick up anything with it, but it's just enough. And there's a reason I do that rather than using a magnet. Because if you took a magnet and set it down on a wood table, uh, this is a metal table and so is that one. I never recommend ever douse it on metal. It upsets your polarity. Okay. I usually sit in a wood chair if I'm dowsing a photograph, which I can do. And so, so Cotton, especially white cotton, is a north polarity. This is pure sheep wool. Sheep wool is south polarity. It, it, it pulls that from the ethers. It was very important to the ancient people whether they wore cotton and, or whether they wore wool. Among the Hebrews, it was forbidden for any everybody anybody to wear a mixture of cotton and wool except the priests. Really? Oh yeah, that was in the works of Flavius Josephus. Huh. And there's a reason for that and what it does to your brain. At any rate, so I use this antenna here is neutral. And it's my most used antenna. Because if you got a polarity problem on a target, you need a neutral antenna. And it's basically a bamboo is about the best thing you can get for a neutral antenna. Huh. Most things are, they have one polarity dominant or the other. This is a little plastic PVC pipe, so it was South Pole. So what I did is I stuffed it full of silk, because silk is neutral. And then I wrapped it with silk. And so it's a neutral antenna to overcome the polarity, the South Polarity that was in it. But it would have worked just as good with the bamboo. So this is, there's no, the only metal here is this and it's far away from the rest. Heaven's a very important antenna. So you're dowsing a target and you're looking for silver. You know there was silver in this area. And then over 20, 30, 40, 50 feet away, 100 feet away, there's a massive body of clay. Nine out of 10 deposits of clay is south polarity. And so you got south polarity here, you got south polarity in your silver. So what happens is the clay being south polarity and the silver being south polarity, it pushes the silver signal away from the target. So you get a signal some other place on silver. So that's what happens. They so, repel. So that's because I believe there's something to dowsing, and I've watched <laughs> dowsers do this. Yes. But they but they, I've never watched a dowser actually find anything, a treasure. And you're saying, they don't. And that's kind of a ghost signal type thing? It, that's what the ghost signal. I've watched them find other things, okay. but never a treasure. Now, another thing happens too. So let's say you're dowsing for gold. Now gold is north polarity. The clay south polarity. What's the problem there? 
If it's enough clay, because north attracts south, it'll take the gold signal and pull it over to the clay, and it'll come out of the clay. And you'll, oh my God, I got a treasure here, and you'll dig for days. And all you find is clay. <laughs> so it's gonna, sad. So you're going to tell me how to fix that problem. I will. Awesome. Ah, there's a fix coming. Okay. I have had dozens and dozens of people bury targets for me and tell me within four or five thousand feet where they were at. And, I, and then photograph it overhead, email that photograph to me, and then I would mark where it was at and they would say, you hit it right on the money. I always do. But after that sits for a while, like if you bury copper or lead or silver, zinc, tin, it doesn't matter. After about six months, it will get signal drift and it'll, start, it'll climb towards something else. Always. Ah. And then you... Uh, that's what I suspected. Always yeah, that's what happens. That's what happens. After it's been there for a year, I did this one target on the Larson Ranch, and it was copper, 27 pounds of copper. I, he buried it. I found it. And after six months, its signal came at 40 feet away. After a year, it was 80 feet away. Really? Mm-hmm. And you have a fix for that? I do. So, and I, and I just even want to say, even with an EM83 or resistivity machines, they are also subject to the principles of polarity in signal warping. The M83 is. The yes, it is. Really? If you want to stop it, there is a stop for that too. Get yourself four ground rods, long ones, and get yourself a bottle, a gallon of very salty water. And where you think the target is, you drive a ground rod in four places that surrounds that target. And you, you salt it, good salt, that it'll make contact with the ground. And then you run an electrical wire with alligator clips to every one of them you've created a, a ground. Leave it there for anywhere from, it depends on how deep the target is, if it's not very deep in about one hour, you'll quit reading on it if it's a fake target. If it's real, ah, so so. Oh yes. Oh, so so. You're saying you do this to check if you got a real target or not. Uh, you do. So if it's if it's, if it's real, it'll still read on it. If it's fake, if it's a ghost read, it'll be gone. You won't read a thing on it with the EM83 or the resistive. Machine. Robert, you know how many people you just helped? <laughs> there, it's untold. Okay, now if it's a very deep target, I did one that was a hundred feet. I verified the target later by using a well rig, a little miniature well rig I had, and I drilled all the way down to it, broke through, and dropped the, an electric eye down there and looked at the target. And I always verify my work. It doesn't mean anything. Right. Okay. I can't get that target. It's an ancient burial. But I had to put those rods in the ground and leave it there for 24 hours because that was such a deep target. Another thing you can do... So, so let me back up. You drive the ground rods, you salt them you, with salt water, you just put wire, connect them all with the wire, you don't hook a battery to them or anything? No, just, no battery. Okay. What that does, I noticed, the way I learned that, I noticed that when I was dowsing, I could douse a house and I always hit everything in the house. This was many years ago, I never missed a house. But when I would go out in the country, I'd start missing targets about 50% of them. Well, even when I had people bury them. This was many years ago. I can think it's because the house is grounded. Ah. Big cognition. Yep. So then I tested it time and time again. It works every time. And a dowser, there's ways to douse to overcome that too. But another thing you can do too, if you're, if you're a dowser, and you're dowsing the ground, you're sure there's a target there, you're getting a read, oh my God, it's reading well. Go to the hardware store and buy a big roll of window screen that's made out of metal, not plastic. Open it up and drag that window screen right over it. Put a few rocks on it, let it sit there for a while. It works like a Faraday cage. Really? And then if it's there, you'll, fit, you'll hit it, if you can douse. If, if it's not there, <laughs> you, 
you'll find out. But you have to let it sit for a while to uh, take effect. And sometimes you'll cut it in half and do, you know, eight feet by, you know, 30 feet or whatever to cover a broad area. I've tested that many times, okay? <laughs> anyway, then we'll go on to dowsing. I'll get this little board and I'll show it to you. I made this little board for dowsing. Yeah. Lots of times people douse and they'll put it on a metal table and it's a no-no. They'll sit on a metal chair and that's a no-no. You interfere a lot with polarity. So you need to be un ungrounded and oh, yes. out of the You have to be out of them. Try it. This is just a piece of styrofoam. It lifts me up off the metal table, some. A wood table is what I use when I do serious dowsing. And this is hemp. So is this hemp material. It's neutral. So when you're out in the field dowsing, would you stand on something like that then? Oh, I, I, I don't have to usually, but if I want to question it, I will put the screen over it. Or I'll do the grounding with the four ground rods. And that'll always, because you don't want to dig a hole and waste any time digging a hole. Right, right. It, it's just a lot of work. Heck okay. Yeah. So when I'm dowsing, let's say for gold, I have these little containers, okay. Now you can use frequencies in a sine wave generator, but I'm here to tell you that the frequencies that people use are inaccurate. What they do is they'll take the molecular weight of an element, and that will be the frequency of that element. So the molecular weight, for example, of gold is um, 197.6 or 9, okay, so they'll punch that in. And what happens is that's the molecular weight, and yes, sometimes it can, but we have a moon cycle that raises and lowers the tide, and it'll raise and lower the ground that we walk on in a 28-day 20, 20, period, 18 inches. Mm. We don't see it visibly, but what it does is it changes the atomic spacing in and out. Mm. So that frequency is based on the atomic spacing. So you have the frequency of gold and now it changes. So then what do you do? You don't know what to do. It doesn't work anymore. You dig another hole, empty hole. But what you do, what works and what is reliable all the time is always and always the proton frequency. So you take the number of protons in gold, which is 79, and you punch in 79 cycles per second in your sine wave generator. Or you can double it and put it in a higher octave, or double it again. So if you're looking for mercury, you would punch in 80 hertz, or 80 cycles per second. Because the proton frequency is never off. Huh. The neutron can wobble. And definitely the molecular weight, not even the moon cycle can stop the proton frequency. There is no element on Earth that has, every element on Earth has its own proton frequency and there's no two elements that have the same proton frequency. It's impossible. Huh. So that's the frequency you use of any element. If it's 10, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's rhodium, then the cycles would be 45 per second, 45 cycles per second, or double that, which would be 90, or double that and then you get those frequencies. So if you're going to use frequency detection, you better use a proton frequency. I've written articles about that. Where do we find your articles? Oh, I can email them to you. So if I give your email out to these guys, they can email you? Oh, sure. Send I'll, send them, I'll send them information that, on it. Is that too big a... Because you might get flooded with emails. Is that too big for you? Well, I get about five hundred spam emails a day that go into spam so I might get two or three I might and but I get good emails and I keep those on my computer and I answer them as much as I can I don't think I've ever left anybody out okay so there's another way of dowsing and I'll just demonstrate this here this is 20 grams of gold okay I'm gonna take a piece of tape I usually just use a rubber band. Oh, wait a minute. I got a rubber band there. Okay. I'm going to fasten it to this antenna. Now, this is a neutral antenna. Okay. Now, what you do, 
I'll be right back. I'm glad you got a long cord on it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a photograph. And that's those are three tar those are two targets that I hit in uh, in, a, in an Asiatic country. Okay. For a guy that's he's already done them with us after I did this, he checked them out with a satellite. Okay. And they were all a hit. There's actually five total, but here there's only two. Anyway, I can't say who he yeah, yeah. they are, of course, but so, and, and just so people know, you're just not anybody. You work for people all over the country, well, all over the world. Uh, this guy is um, a very professional. He's not a millionaire, but he's a billionaire. Uh -huh. And he's got, he's got me in for a percentage. But those foreign, I don't count my chickens for the hats because I know quite a few people that are professional treasure hunters, like Bill Gallagher and some of them. And... and he did, a, he did one in Colombia, and he had contract with the Colombian government, and they just took it. They wouldn't keep their deal with him. I've heard that with the, some it, of the I did some salvers that's done that on the, out in the ocean. They exactly. The same problem, yeah. I did two of them in the Philippines for these guys, and the government stopped them and took it. Huh. So I didn't get anything yeah. out of it. Yeah. So this one over here, and <laughs> I don't know if I get anything out of it or not. I mean, they mean well. They are professionals. They have plenty of funding. Okay, so this right here is the target, okay? So I've got gold on there, right? So I'm gonna go like this and watch what happens. I just kind of an imaginary line like this and I'm gonna go over the photograph. Hang on, okay. Watch this, I'm thinking, of bingo. You see how that antenna just stopped on it? Bingo. So then I turn it around. It's called kind of like triangulation. And I want to see where at in here it's at. Bingo, right there. And then I turn it around here. Bingo. But when you look at a photograph, if you focus your attention here, and the gold is here, what will happen is your mind will pull the signal over to here. So you got to keep up. You got to focus on the entire photograph when you're doing this and you have to be totally totally mentally neutral. If you have any any preconceived notions or desires or hopes that are strong, it'll affect it. And it'll pull the signal to where you want it to be. So, I'm just looking at the whole photograph, bingo. So I hit that one before. Now, I keep going. I I erase that mentally and I keep going. Bingo, I hit another one. So, so I'm noticing that that's hitting the paper. It is. So what happens is... Is it, is it pulling down on you? Or a photograph something? is like a fingerprint. Okay. And as far as the mind is concerned, there is no such thing as distance. So your mind will actually, mentally will actually go... I've actually seen scientific documentations on the fact that they put people halfway around the world and put a headset on them and had that person think of this person at certain time periods and then logged it, it registered on his brainwaves. Huh. Every time when they synchronized it. Oh really? Most people don't know that, but I've seen, I've, I've researched some of that. And I thought when I read that, well why can't I doubt then from a photograph which represents an area, it's a picture of it. Yeah. My mind will go there. And I did a blind test for a guy that had re retired from NASA and I found a monument on the moon in a blind test from a photograph, they call it the Tin Man. It was put there in honor of the astronauts that lost their lives or were injured on the moon. Huh. And the moon's a long ways away, but it doesn't yeah. matter because, like Lao Tzu said, a picture's worth a thousand words. And so I can douse a, a photograph uh, just as good as I can out in the field. Actually, probably better. Because really? I can hold wide perspective on a, a large area, you know. I did one for, I did three blind test for my friend Bruce Judd in Kanab, Utah. And one of them was a, a well casing that he left out in the country 40 years ago because they hit bad water. And it was like 270 feet of well casing so they just drove it in, covered it up with dirt and left. And, and I says, well, give me, a, give me a GPS of a five mile square area. Just give me the corners. Four GPSs and he did. And so I, dow I printed it out, doused it, 
marked it. You can't see it on the photograph. You can, all you yeah, see yeah, yeah. It. and sent it to him. And then I called him on the phone. And he looked at it. He said, "He said, Robert, you hit it right on the wellhead." Really? Mm hmm. Another time, he he told me he buried a bunch of he crushed a bunch of cars that were old and worthless back in 1960, and he buried them out on the farm in a big hole in one big pile. I says, tell me where, about where that's at. Don't tell me where it's at, but tell me within a few thousand feet. And he says, well, he says, it's up Johnson Canyon, by the old, not too far from the old movie set. Can you find it? And I says, you'll find out. So I uh, printed it out, pulled it up on Google Earth, doused it, and I marked two deposits that he didn't tell me about. Oh, really? I, I emailed it to him, and then I called him on the phone, and I said, all right, Bruce. I said, pull it up. He pulled it up on Google. And I said, you didn't tell me that there was two deposits there. And he says, oh, I forgot. And about then the photograph came up and he says, and you nailed them both right on the, right on the mark. Really? Uh, that was the kind of blind test I did for years. Huh. I, I, I depended on dozens and dozens of people that I know yeah. that would trust me. You know, right, and, right, and, right. and I doused his house and told him where he hid his jewelry. Different things. Well, deal stuff. I won't say what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a dumpster in the back. It was big, and I th I couldn't tell from Google whether it was a th was a little camper trailer or a dumpster. But I, I detected a piece of lead in one end, and a piece of lead in the other end. And so I emailed it to him. I you know I draw a line on it and mar a circle and mark it lead lead, and the stuff in his house and around his yard. And, I emailed it to him and he says, yeah, he says, I just threw away two batteries last week and they're in the dumpster. One's at one end. He said, the other one's at the other end. Oh, really? So that's where you're getting the lead. And of course, I had checked for sulfuric acid and detected that too. So, so how, <coughs> how, how do you, how do you know to even, I mean, you're detecting, you're dousing this, but how do you oh, know yeah. what it is? That's gold. If I wanted to detect lead, I put a piece of lead on there. So, so you didn't know what was in the dumpster? So oh, I had no clue. You can't see so it. So you just put all different types of elements on your... I could have either used the frequency of lead and the proton frequency, which would charge my whole system with that frequency. And then when I doused the photograph, it would have went right to any lead anywhere. Uh -huh. And it, would, it usually picks the largest piece first. If you mark them and phase them out, then you might start finding lead weights and... Stuff like that, you know, it's all, everything there is, like metals that put out a signal. You don't even really have to stimulate them. They're already sending out a signal. So I just detect the signal that way. Like right here, I have um, mineral element samples. I've got a sample of all, of 80 elements. They're in glass tubes. Some of them are, some of them are, uh, are gases, and so I could always, I can put any rare earth metal on there. Here's our platinum group metals. All six of them are in here, huh. and silver, and so I just put that on my dowsing rod. Another thing I do is if I'm looking for gold, and if I find it, and if I want to verify the read, what I do is I put a tube of krypton gas here. The reason I do is because there is no such thing as gold that's buried that doesn't have krypton gas hovering it. Really? It's attracted to it. And so I'll put a tube of krypton gas right on the uh, here. And then that verifies it just more to verify. Krypton gas hovers and it doesn't get distorted. It doesn't have signal distortion. Hmm. So it's just another safeguard. If some, one of my clients is going to dig a target, I don't want to be wrong because I charge them. Yeah. And and then I would have to give. You know, if I was wrong, I would give them their money back. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, that's. Pretty much the essence. So a photograph is uh, people. It's a part of the mind that very few people have ever learned to train or had it trained or developed in that way. But I started doing detection work about 
30 years ago. Uh -huh. So it was a long time ago and I bought a lot of equipment and did a lot of jobs for, you know, some of them was for mining companies and, and, and treasure hunters alike, you know. So I had to learn how to douse because it's so much faster. You can take a five square mile area and you can cover that entire area in a day. How'd you like to cover it on foot? Yeah, you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, I did a job for a guy in uh, Iran once a few years ago and they were desperate people they were from Europe and they'd gone to Iran and they doused this large body of copper and they charged them eighty thousand dollars for that work and it covered an area of miles and they missed the target so they arrested them and they were going to keep him in prison and take him to trial for fraud so a guy by the name of Peter called me and he says, can you save these people? They're good, they're good Christians and they don't belong in prison. And I said, well, I charged him about one quarter of the price I normally charge. And I charged him for it, located the vein of copper. It was pretty big. Huh. I located an aquifer underneath it. And I located a pretty rich vein of gold that went right through it. Did all of that from an image. The fo or aerial photograph, really? sent it to them. They went and car drilled it and hit it and turned those guys loose. Really? Uh, so water is pretty easy to find. Most people that douse can douse water and they can hit it. But when it comes to metals, it's where they fail. See, your body is made out of water, okay? Mostly. Oh, that's why they can get water. Right, but at, at, at body temperature, water is slightly north polarity, okay? If at about 60 degrees, it's neutral. At 40 degrees or 50 degrees, 52 degrees, that's the average temperature of the Earth underground, water is south pole, negative. So what happens, you got this water in your body, and it's positive, and the water in the ground is negative, and it just attracts just like that. So you put a little bottle of water on your dowsing thing. My uncle was a, my uncle Wayne was a well driller, and he would put a bottle of water on his dowsing rod. He never missed, he, he, he had a guarantee that if I missed the water, no charge. He never had to give anybody the money back. Huh. Because Wayne hit it every time, so. But water's pretty pretty easy to tell. You know, there's a an aquifer that comes right through our valley here, from the other side of uh, Mount Pleasant, and it goes out towards Fish Lake. And I would like to see him tap that water supply because the cities and the and the farmers need that water really bad. But I, I'm talking to some of the city fathers right now about that. But, uh, anyway. So much for that. So polarity is very, very important. Um, I would get a bamboo and make my own dowsing rod because it's neutral and you can certainly use the white wool. Excuse me, the darker the wool, the better. And white cotton for your negative and positive. So what I do too is I'll, I'll give you an example I'm not on, on, on doing this. So this is an antenna, okay. Let me put the gold back on it and I'll show you how you can tell the volume, the rough volume of, of gold, okay? And you gotta focus on it, and you gotta hold your attention there for a while, and make sure it's Johnny on the spot, and accurately, and that, that's done after you've already doused it. So if you've doused a target, you just focus on it. Focus on it, focus on it, and don't ever put your legs together. Keep your legs apart. Uh -huh. Because <laughs> you don't hold your teeth together. Really? Keep them apart. Mm -hmm. There's very, there's the little nuances, and they're very meaningful when you're dowsing because polarity dominates everything, and you mess around with your polarity. Okay. Now I'm looking at that target. I'm focused on it. Okay. Okay. See how it pushes that away when I focus on that target? No. I'm going to focus some other place. My attention is near, but here, 
<coughs> there's about 2,000 pounds of gold there. And how do you know that? Uh, because I can tell by the, I will lay a yardstick down, like here, and then I'll start doing this, let's see. And the sun targets will only repel about that far or this far oh, so or this far. But that one repelled so far that I had to walk into here, put the photograph up on the door, walk into the bedroom, and hold my dowsing rod like this. And when I got close, I got to that filled extension, it pushed back. And I have a scale, so many inches and so many feet and so many pounds. So you can tell about the size of the target. It's never going to be 100%, but it's going to be close. Maybe 80%. So, so if I do both targets, it would I couldn't even hold it. It would go. I'd have to go in the other room and then focus on it. And then there's also silver in these two targets, so I could do the same with silver. Now you can pretty well tell what you're dealing with. You don't want to deal with the an ounce of gold and dig six feet for it. Yeah, no, you don't. It's too much work. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's... Also, when I did these targets, gold, gold, this is Japanese burial, where they buried the gold during World War II. So right here is an enormous bomb. And all of these are encased in iron. Okay. This bomb has TNT in it. It has a detonator right here, which is fulminated mercury. And the trigger is right here. So they have to bring in a bomb squad when they retrieve that. So how did you figure out to douse that stuff? Well, uh, I have mercury. I detected mercury here. And then I took a picture of fulminated mercury. And some other things. And I read on fulminated mercury. And then I took a picture of TNT. This is a real life package of it. And I just focus on that. Put it here. Focus on that. And then I'll take a, and I'll write on a piece of paper TNT right there on my antenna. And then I'll move over it and over it and over it. And then bingo, it locks onto it. And then I did the fulminated mercury. I kind of turned this around this way. I hit, I hit it. Just by looking at it. So then I turned the photograph around and I thought, oh, it's right on the front of the bomb. Okay. So I get this location. All right. Uh, so basically they know. And then on that target, what I had them do, because this is a, isn't a good enough image for extreme detail. So I had them fly over in a drone plane with camera on it that had high resolution. Photograph it 50 feet up, 100 feet up, 150 feet up. And then I went over it, and then I'm right accurate pretty much to the blade of grass. Mm. But satellite images, even though they can detect the target, they cannot identify those, all those elements and tell you what they are. I can. And another thing... A satellite image can be off as much as 60, 60 meters. Really? So they can't just go in there haphazardly, recklessly, and start digging because they could get killed. So then they go in there typically with instrumentation. Sometimes metal detectors with big coils and different things. And they say, okay, there's a target here, here, and here. Of course, they're all in iron. They can tell that with a magnetometer. And the, which one is the bomb and which one is the time? I can tell, but and but they still need a bomb squad. They got to disarm it before they can get it. And the Japs buried buried a lot of targets in the Philippines, a lot in Singapore, huh. Indonesia. Really? Yeah, and they the ones that they brought to the surface of the ground. Well, they mined it from ancient. <laughs> this isn't very well known. Most of the gold that the Japs had, they mined from ancient burials. Really? Yeah. They melded down their artifacts. I have pictures of some of those artifacts. Huh. Beautiful work. And then they put it in their own form, and um, that's where basically where they got their gold.
Huh. It's one of those big secrets. And uh, the ancients buried a lot of stuff, just like the stuff that was found in the Grand Canyon in 1908, where it was excavated by the Smithsonian Institute. Those were ancient burials, and those people were very decorated in sarcophaguses. Yeah. And there's not only that tunnel that Kincaid found. I've checked that area out. I've gone there, too. There's a tunnel. It's 1,700 feet long. 100 feet from it's another tunnel. The 1700 feet long. Oh. 100 feet from there is another tunnel that's 1700 feet long. And underneath those tunnels, about 100 feet deeper, is another tunnel, and another tunnel, and another tunnel, six layers deep. It's a mass, mass burial ground, is what it is. Really? Yeah, and that's not the only place where there are. Victoria Peak, New Mexico, is as much as that. Many, many, many burial grounds. And what the Spanish did was they mined them. melded it down. They didn't get everything. Cerro de Oro in Bolivia, which is a famous gold mine, so much gold came out of Cerro de Oro, Bolivia, that it raised the average European's wealth eight times. That's in the book called Indian Givers by Jack Weatherford. Huh. And what they were doing was they were mining similar burials. Really? That's a world secret that people just don't know. I know because I can tell. After over 300 blind tests that have been verified, I don't question what I detect. Right. And those ancient burials did not just have gems, gold and silver, they also had some platinum group metals. Huh. It is believed by our science that nobody knew how to recover platinum or refine it. When the Spanish found it, they thought it was embryo gold, and they left it behind. So I checked out those tunnels in Bolivia. The gold is gone, the silver is gone, the sum of the platinum is still there. They left it. Huh. Because it was, they didn't have any, they didn't understand yeah, it in gold. those days. Yeah. So that's one way I can check the nature and the character of a gold deposit. Like I did a ship, a sunken ship for these people. I check for gold and silver. I check for brass, which is zinc and copper. I check for bronze, which is <laughs> copper and tin. <laughs> and by the time I got to checking everything, I says it's got to be either a Spanish or Portuguese or Dutch ship. And the cannons, sometimes they made them out of iron, sometimes they made them out of bronze. So you can basically identify pretty much what something is by what by its actual contents. Mm. So, and I can identify drugs too, but I've always refused to do any of that work because I'm not tired of living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are dangerous people, but uh, but I don't mind, you know, doing doing work for people. There. Anyway, any questions do you have, Terry? So. One, you talked about the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Um, what do you know about the, the the Grand Canyon, what was found in the Grand Canyon? Because I know you're a researcher, you study your well, you connections, you've got, what, what do you know about that? That's on the web. You can do a lot of research on the web. Kincaid, it was the guy that discovered it. Way back in, you know, in 1908, the Smithsonian excavated it. You, and they closed it up, they took some, some of the artifacts, put them and shipped them to California, put them on a boat, and the boat mysteriously sank. Really? Wayne May covered that in the Ancient American magazine. Ah. He did a good job. But they laid everybody off and some of those people felt like it was a dirty deal and a cover up, so they went to the Gazette there in Arizona and spilled their guts. Ah. And told them what they seen and what was there and how it was covered up. So that's how that got out. Uh, that's a real famous site, but I'm a very curious person. Yes, you are. <laughs> and I can't help it. <laughs> yeah. I checked that out. I even checked out the Skinwalker Ranch and a lot of places, you know, anomalies, you know. So, and. Uh, okay, tell me about. Well, before, I'm going to ask you about Skinwalker Ranch, but back. 
So I don't know if you know that I'm tracking down some Egyptian hieroglyphs that's been found down at Lake Powell, which is formed by the Colorado River, which throws goes through the Grand Canyon. I remember that. Have you done anything with that area? Is there? Uh, I ha I anything? haven't. I, I haven't done anything with it. I think one time I was going to try to find. You gave me a picture of those Egyptian things. Yeah. And I think I doused it to see where they were at. I can't remember. But. Uh, but now I haven't done any work. There's, there's about, and I wouldn't even be able to guess, but a wild guess would be, there's anywhere from a thousand to ten thousand things, more things on the ground than the John Q. Public would even even guess in his wildest dreams, and it's basically from ancient civilizations really? that lived and prospered a long time ago. You know, this Earth is pretty old. So, so. It's been around for a long time. So, what do you think about the Uinta Mountains? And do you think that was mine, or do you think that was they found ancient? I nine ancient out of burials and, ninety-five percent. And robbed them, or they or? did. Ninety-five percent of them, the, of their mines were ancient burials, and they dug it up, and they 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 melted it down, put it in bars, and doubloons and pieces of air and they uh, left a lot of deposits in Utah Arizona Nevada New Mexico Montana and what they did was a typical vault will go like this you'll find a large deposit of gold and it's not in the hundred pounds it's way beyond that really and then there'll be a tunnel that leaves it There'll be a tunnel that goes into it that's hidden, and you probably have to dig 30 feet just to just to get to the okay. That tunnel will go like this it, to another deposit. It'll be as big. Then it'll come back and do another one. It makes a triangle. Hmm. They're all in triangles, and there's a lot of gold in them, and they're all over the country. But they're it would take a mining engineer. It would take somebody with serious capabilities and abilities to penetrate those because so they didn't make them easy those large vaults and they're booby trapped you know I'm in my 72nd year and I'm not going to go dig them I'll tell you that <laughs> but there's a lot yeah there's a lot of them. the New, New Mexican one I doused that Victoria Peak and most of it's still there so so I I know quite a bit about Victoria Peak um, about the treasure that's taken out, about Johnson and all that stuff, but as you're saying, there's still something there? More of it is there than they ever took. Really? Because mm -hmm. they took a lot out. They took tons. Well, they out. did, but there's still a lot, tons left. Really? Uh, serious amounts of tons. I did a job for some guys many years ago. They were from Arkansas, okay? And there was an electrical engineer and a guy that was a satellite specialist from NASA. He would retired from NASA. And I didn't meet those guys. I met their golfer, the guy that would go out and get the stuff for them. And they, they run a pretty good business. What they'd done is they had an on the ground monitor and receiver and the guy from NASA had the code so he would turn the satellite on areas. But they had a way of charging the ground which I won't mention in a certain way. And what it does, once they charge it, they let it cool for about 24 hours. Then when they put the satellite on it, the images come out very clear. Very clear. Mm. So they hit this one in the Uintas, and it was multiple, multiple, multiple tunnels. The Spanish had been there, and they did their deposits. And before they could, before James Pierce was the golfer, he's, he's, he's dead now. Either that, he he's not going to get out of that rest home with Alzheimer's mm. okay the the two engineers that will the guy from NASA and the electrical engineer the guy the electrical engineer got arrested on a cocaine charge he was moved and the other guy turned Alzheimer's really bad so then Pierce and the other guy was trying to find it and they asked me to help him this was many years ago I wasn't nearly as good at it and I wouldn't say I didn't I think I found it but it's on private property and there's two pieces of private property there and the entire complex is tunneled 
Huh. Just like I'm talking about. And uh, they stripped the gold out of some of the tunnels and the silver and the gems, but not all of them. And I can tell because it's a typical burial because the one over there in uh, the Colorado River also has platinum in it. Typically, they all have platinum in them. Mm. And uh, so that's what that one is, and it uh, probably will never be excavated. And these guys are pretty much out of the picture now. I took one of their machines that they use for resonation, and I tore it apart, and I looked at the frequencies from the software they had and recorded all that information. I could do it now if I really needed to. But I have to find a satellite guy to work with me, and then if we want a, a real clear picture, we could actually get one. I have a satellite guy. Do you? Yep. Well, I, I could certainly do that, and you certainly get some good pictures. Whoa, there's a one guy in Germany, and I don't have his name, they wouldn't tell me who he was, that knows how to do that, but the thing is, and he does it. Well, I know how to do it, I just need a satellite guy. Yeah. And uh, I, can do, I can charge the ground in the same way they did. And then we pretty yeah, we may do that on the target. Cool. Cool. <laughs> so now back to Skinwalker Ranch. Okay. Um, because that's a kind of a hit TV show on the History Channel. What do you? If I told you the there? truth about that, you may not want to put it on this video. Really? Yeah. Okay. You can cut it off if you want. Well, you you tell me if you want it on or off. I okay. want it cut off. I'll cut it out. If you don't, I won't. Okay. I'll tell you a fact. There's a place over by Sigurd, Utah. Okay. okay. Now there's a gal that lived in Sigurd, Utah, Charlene Hunt, that I knew very well. I knew I her. I met for, her. I knew her for many years. She's dead now. Yeah. So I'd been shooting signals across I-70 to the north and to the foothills there across from Sigurd. And I picked up those tunnels, a lot of them. And a lot of gold in them, a lot of platinum, a lot of silver. And then the Spanish had been in there. Their symbols are there. There's a Spanish treasure there. I got a friend of mine to file on it, and it turned out BLM wouldn't let him file on it. They says it was taken off the filing thing. Really? I did another one like it that was the same way. He couldn't, and they rejected his filing and gave him his money back. Really? Some of them are protected, okay? They're not publishing it to the public. They're not saying this is what we're protecting, but they're protected. So I went through the area, and then I detected something very, 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 very unusual. I set it for bones, you know, human bones, my detection, and I locked on to some human bones. They're everywhere. But this one case, it was moving. I tracked it. I said, no, there's nobody underground here. No, no, no. So I thought, I got home and I thought about it and I went back and I pulled up my EM83 and then I did my dowsing and pulled my EM83 out, tried my resistivity machine. I was shooting very deep and I had to have like 600 feet of cable with that EM83 to shoot that deep. Uh -huh. and, and I detected thorium, I detected beryllium, water, and boron. Those are the main components in a nuclear reactor. Really? Mm -hmm. Deep underground. Deep. And I thought, this is pretty weird. It was a funny feeling there. So. One day, I like Charlene Hunt because she was a gal that would speak her mind and she shot from the hip. And she didn't, she didn't BS anybody. She wouldn't. Yeah. And if you believed her, fine. If you did, the heck with you. Yeah. And I, I appreciate people like that. You know they're not going to BS you. So I asked her one day, I says, have you ever noticed anything odd or strange across I-70 into the foothills right there? And she says, Robert, I'm going to tell you just like it is. Believe me or believe me not. I said, what is it, Charlene? I respect you. You, you. I respect you. She says, well, I have seen UFOs fly in and out of there at least a hundred times in my lifetime. One time I was pretty close and the ground would shimmy like something out of Star Trek. And then you'd see a gaping hole and these saucers would pop out like this. And then it would just come back solid like there was nothing there. Huh. And you couldn't tell. You could walk over it. And then she says, one time I watched them do that, and there was a large, large one, way high. And they were going in and out of the large spaceship, back, and then back down to the ground like it was almost like a cargo ship. 
I said, Charlene, I believe you. I have no reason to disbelieve you. But stuff I've detected there is absolutely outrageous. And I don't even have an answer for it. So I went ahead and did some more detection. And I thought, oh boy. So the top tunnels are burials for those people that live. They have very high tech. So, so you're saying there's people living underground there now? Uh, all of those places that I've ever detected, I always detect nuclear activity. The Skinwalker Ranch is no different. And what the phenomena is there, the strange phenomena, is high-tech scarecrow to keep people away from their vortex where they ingress and degress. That's all it is. There's others just like it in Utah. There's a guy that lives in Helper. He's a doctor. And he has a ranch, and he found one on his site. Mm. He did a hidden camcorder and a motion detector and got some of the phenomena on video, and I have watched it personally, as has my friend Robert Baker. Mm. And uh, he was Robert's doctor, or, or dentist. And he videoed some of that. You could actually, on one scene, you could see a, the snow was falling, and there was about that much snow on the ground. And you could hear somebody walking and breathing, but you couldn't see them. Really? And you could see their footprints go into the ground like this. Okay? Really? And then after about a minute, they disappeared and it looked just like snow. Who can do that? I don't know. He's not. <laughs> How do you answer that? So, but then I've checked out other places like Skinwalker Ranch. It's always a similar phenomena. There's some in Arizona. Mr. Edmonds in Arizona has one. You can find him on the web. He's selling, trying to sell the house to get the hell out of it because the phenomena is so powerful. And I told him, just, just fence that vortex area. You might want to use copper wire or move your house a little bit. Just leave them alone and they'll leave you alone. So why that phenomena? It's there. Uh, there's some places uh, in different places in the world that I've checked out. I've investigated a bunch of them. And every time I find, even some of the vortexes, like there's one in Oregon, there's one in uh, Montana, there's one in, uh, I think, Washington State. You can get on YouTube, you can look them up, you can watch them. And, and the place in Washington, they build a little cabin over it. And you go in there, and tourists come in there all the time. And they have this little slide that goes uphill. And they put these little balls in there, and you go in there, and the balls just roll uphill. Mm. The one in California does it. The one in Montana does it. And, uh, <laughs> and you kind of stand kind of funny. The gravity kind of twists you like this and like this. So I tested those with polarity. And every one of them will have a magnetic field that comes up like this out of the ground. It'll go down into the ground, and the further, the deeper it goes, the wider it gets, even to the point of several miles. Mm. But the deeper it goes, the wider it gets, and every one of them are shaped like a pyramid. Mm. But most of them are not revealed to the surface of the ground. You've got to do your detection deeper down into the ground to keep either, either two or three feet or... 10, 15, and 20 feet. And all these underground cities that I detect, that's what I think they are, are shaped like a pyramid. They do the same thing if you go deep enough. So you tell me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot about it. Mostly, I know a little bit about it from what I do. But uh, I've, known, I've known people that have, that have told me they've talked to them. Really? One of them was the famous late great John Brewer, who I met when I was 26 years old. He told me he spent one day in their underground city. I don't think he was lying to me, but I can't prove it one way or the other, and that's not my purpose, but right. I will talk about it, and it's up to anybody else that listens to it, whether they believe it or not, or, you know. But uh, anyway, I told you it was pretty far out. So, so speaking of John Burr, uh -huh. will you tell me the story of John Burr? Well, I, I met him when I was 26, and 
we became good friends. I visited him a lot. He worked at the sewer plant in Moroni, Utah, and he usually did graveyard shifts, so I'd go there and sometimes I'd, I would talk to him all night. And I had a brother that sometimes was with me, sometimes he went, actually a half-brother. And we became good friends, and then, uh, so we'd go places, sometimes in the hills, and talk, and he was the kind of a treasure hunter. He looked for things. But he found this cave, and there was a lot of strange stuff in it. And uh, one of the things that was in there is he had these little, uh, they looked like cups. They were made out of solid metal. They weren't hollow. But the top had a little depression in it like that. And they had these little crystal spheres that you'd put on them, and when you put them on them, they'd light up. In Brewer's Cave? Oh, absolutely. They're there. Absolutely. Really? Light up bright. Really? Now, I have... Three references to that. I met a guy in Mount Pleasant. He lived behind my dentist, Dr. Sorensen. He had retired from NASA. And then he moved to Mesquite, Nevada. And he had some health problems. I think he had one of his legs cut off. A nice guy. And he had a little instrument that looked like a pen, about that long. It wasn't a pen, but it looked like it. And on the end, instead of having an eraser, he had a little crystal. And uh, he pressed a button, pushed something up on a slider, and the thing just lit up and glowed bright, bright, bright. I mean, I go, woo! I said, Les, what is that? And he says, well, <laughs> he said, that crystal is made out of beryllium. He said, you know, they use that in a nuclear reactor because it speeds up the neutron, speeds them up. And he says it's made out of, it's about, so an emerald, he says, is about 13, 14, 15 percent beryllium. And the rest is quartz and minor minerals. And I said, yeah, I know that. And so he says, well, so he says, I have a, a BB-sized piece of plutonium in there. And I, the slider pushes it up against a crystal with pressure, and it lights up. Hmm. And it did. And uh, my friend Don Aladero saw the same thing. He showed it to him. He lives in Mayfield. My friend Stephen Jepson saw it. He demonstrated it to him and dozens of people in San Pete County. I'm not the only one he showed it to. No, so that's an emerald, okay? It will also work with thorium. A nuclear reactor would work with thorium if they would build them that way, too. Mm. And they were, scientists recommended that they do that, but they didn't do it because they had other purposes for the, for the plutonium. Part of it being for nuclear bombs. But anyway, I was reading in the Lost Books of the Bible, the Pseudopigrapha by Joshua. Oh, Joshua was talking and he had, they had warred with the Amorites who were giants, large people. And, and they killed them. They had to cut them off at the waist. Then they invaded their temples underground and brought out these sacred things to the, to the Amorites. And some of them were crystal spheres. And Joshua said they, they were so bright that they equaled the brightness of the sun. Really? Mm -hmm. He also said some of them like it were in the Ark of the Covenant. That's an energy source. Okay. Now, another place in the Lost Books of the Bible, you read the Testaments of the Prophets and the Levites and Testament of Solomon. Solomon said he was building the temple and he sent one of his pages to go and pick up, I, I think it was in a cave, but somewhere, a large emerald. And he says it had something on it that looked like a tail. And he said, it lit up bright, and he used it to light up the temple so that workers, the courtyard or the yard, so the workers could work all night long. And it says specifically that it was an emerald. And those, those ancient records are very, very old. So what were they doing back in the time of Moses? I didn't write it. Charlesworth wrote it. Hmm. <laughs> so, and I have those quotes. I marked them. Yeah. So, it, it keeps cropping up that knowledge. There were some crystal spheres that were found in South America a long time ago, and they were they they were lit up that way too. And of course, they were confiscated. Really. The Virgin Gorge incident in 1973, when they were blasting through the mountains for a highway. And the entire crew saw this. They set off a big blast. And there was smoke that would blow out of the ground in other places. And it opened up the ground. And there was a tunnel there. And all the workers saw 
massive amounts of light coming out of the ground. And they went inside the tunnel. They found these rooms that were just beautiful, highly polished walls like crystal. And there were these crystal spheres that were putting out massive amounts of light and machines that they did, could, didn't know what they were. And niches where you could put stuff in, and stuff was put in these niches and tables and all, these, all this light coming out of there. They reported it and the government came in, set up a barricade, brought in concrete trucks, and filled up the hole. Really? And told everybody to shut up. But two of those people are still alive. I know people that have talked to them. I haven't talked to them. One of them lives in Leeds, Utah. And uh, one of them took some of those artifacts and hit them out. Uh, I'd sure like to find him and talk to him if he would talk to me because anyway, it was interesting. Mm. There's a lot of that, of that that has surfaced over time, and in my research I've turned up quite a few of them, and I doubt very seriously if they're coincidence hallucinations. I've never even had a hallucination in my entire life, and I've never taken any drugs for it. I don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> God. Anyway, uh, it's far out. Any more questions? Are we done? i got a million questions. Oh, God. <laughs> So, so um, back to the dowsing. So anybody can learn how to do this? If they want to spend the time to focus on it and to test it. And you know, if they're having a problem, if they really want to, I don't want 10,000 emails, but I may help them walk through some of it, you know. What's your email address? Robert Shrewsbury12 at gmail.com. Now the Shrewsbury spelled S-H-R-E-W-S-B-U-R-Y. So what about these guys? I see yours is, you've got yours all insulated. You try hard not to be connected to it, it's looking like to me. But what about these guys that have the copper rods and they're connected? No, never use metal. Never use copper metal. is north polarity. So if you're going for copper that's north polarity, it's going to push your antenna back. And so you'll be off for sure. Yeah. Iron is north polarity. Gold is north polarity. Copper is north polarity. Any one of those is going to push you off. Silver is south polarity. But what you need is a neutral antenna. I wouldn't no more use a metal antenna than fly to the moon. So these guys, these old timers that used to use the, the willow sticks, and then they would put a... You got it. They'd put a sample... It, yes, a sample they were, they were close. They were getting real close. Some woods, and I don't know all of them, but are neutral. And many of them are positive and some of them are negative. You never want to use aspen. Mm. Because aspen has all kinds of elements in it that are very highly reactive. It has, uh, oh God. So you don't ever want to use aspen. It'll fool you constantly. Really? You use the wrong one, it's the wrong thing. I think cherry wood was pretty common in the old day. You can, my uncle used iron, which was an iron dowsing rod, but he always went for water. And he would, he would fasten a big bottle of water on it. But sometimes he used a, a witch willow, when he, especially when he did the depth. So, Uncle Wayne was really good at it, and uh, unfortunately, my last, all my uncles and aunts are dead now. The last one passed about two or three weeks ago. Oh, terrible. Well, uh, I'm 70, almost 72, so they, went, they weren't young. They're all in their 90s, maybe. So, anyway, that's, uh, Water's pretty easy. The, the rules don't follow the water nearly as much as they do the elements that have a serious uh, magnetic. Even silver's paramagnetic. But every metal has some magnetism in it. So it's either dominantly negative or dominantly positive. There are some metals that might be right around neutral. I'm not sure what they are. I'd have to test 80 elements, and that's a lot of work, you know. Yeah. But uh, chemicals are, are no different, you know. You, but if you're checking for, like, say, you're dowsing for gold, and there's gold that's uh, mixed with silver, the Egyptians called that electrum. 
you'll read on silver and gold either way you go, but if it's mixed enough, it'll almost be neutral because one's ne neutral and one's negative. However, the gold in it will still have a polarity and the silver will still have a polarity. So you can't really get away with that. And if you're dowsing for chemical elements, you have to really know, like when I douse this guy's house, whose name I won't mention, I detected a bunch of guns and cases of ammunition. And the way I knew it was ammunition is because I tested it for lead, copper, sulfur, charcoal, and potassium nitrate. And then I tested the volume of each one of those, and those were pretty much the ingredients in a box of ammunition. Mm. So, and brass, you know, zinc and, uh, and, and copper. And, uh, so it's pretty easy to identify that. I did one for one guy, another name I won't mention, and he, said, he, he visits me every once in a while, and he has for years, and he's an older guy. And I told him once, I says, you know, I says, I, I noticed you're cynical about my dowsing. And I like you as a friend, and I still do, but I'd like to change your mind permanently about that. If you're willing, if you've got the guts for it, give me a, the address of your home, and I will print it out. And before you get home to Salt Lake, I'll have doused it and tell you where you hid your things in it. He said, Robert, you're on. And so he gave me his address, and then he left. And he had about an hour or so drive to get home. So I printed it out and doused it, and I put a circle around one part on this roof line. And I says, underneath this circle, you have no small amount of ammunition, at least a case, and about between 40 and 50 ounces of silver, but no gold. And so then I says, on this part of the house, you only have eight or 10 ounces of silver, maybe one gun, and two or three clips of ammunition, and that's it. <laughs> I emailed it to him. Then, as soon as he got home, he called me and he says, Robert, he said, you hit them both. I said, are you cynical now? <laughs> he, he says, no, not, not now. He said, <laughs> it, was, it was fun. It, it's fun to do that. But uh, I've done blind tests for people. I did one for a guy and he, he was cynical. He had 10 acres out in Deer Springs area, a lot of Kanab. And he had hidden some silver out there, and so I doused it and hit it. It was right in the very center of his camper trailer, about 100 ounces. Mm. And then he had a vehicle parked over here. He had silver in the vehicle on the driver's side underneath the seat. And so I emailed it to him, and I says, uh, I says, that car isn't there anymore. That's a Google image. But when it was, it had silver in it. Okay. He says, well, you hit them both. He says, but it was an accident. He says, Sam, you just have a string of luck. He says, that's all that's going on. <laughs> I said, I want you to do another one. So I did another one for him, and I hit it. Hmm. He said, boy, you're the luckiest guy I've ever met. <laughs> so he did a third one, and I hit it. And he says, I I've, I've got some more I want you to do. And I said, no, I I'm not a geek in your circus, and I'm not going to babysit you anymore. You're a doubting Thomas. You always will be. And so that's the end of that. And I ended the test with the guy. So you run across guys like that. You can't. Yeah. They're carved in stone in their belief system. Yep. You can't change it. So I've run across all kinds. Anyway. But uh, it's fun doing it. So anything else you want to talk about on dowsing? Is that about covered? I think that's go? that's kind of the basics. I think for anybody to put that together, d just remember that mind has got to be neutral. Your dowsing rod has to be neutral. Your table has to be neutral. And if all else fails, it's probably your mind not being neutral enough. And if you want to be double careful, Take a piece of window screen that's metal, if you're doing a photograph, put it underneath your photograph, and put a piece over it. And now it works just like a house, not that it's got a ground, but it's got a Faraday cage, and ambient signals that are coming around is not going to interfere with it because it blocks them. That's probably the last double test that anybody would want to do. There's one more thing that's really important about dowsing. Uh, 
if your dial's in a spot and you get a, a strong read, okay, that there's values there, okay? If somebody digs up a treasure and then they cover the hole back up and if they leave with that treasure and it's not there anymore, that spot will read as a treasure for dowsing, even sometimes with electronic instruments because it leaves a signature behind. And so you dig a hole and there's nothing there. So what I've done to do this and what works for me is I'll do it. I'll do a site and I always put today's date on it. Like for example, today is July the 6th, 7th, 2021 only. And then if it still reads, it's a real target. But if it's, or I'll go back and I'll say this is uh, 2020. This is uh, July the 7th, 2020 and the read's gone. Somebody took it. The treasure's gone. You have to date them to know where you're at. That's very, very important. A lot of people have dug a lot of, a lot of vacant holes without knowing that. So that was probably, that's the final thing on it. So, now I just gave you secrets that. You, uh, you did give secrets. I, I'm sure a lot of people will know exactly what you're talking about. Some of them kind of went over my head because I'm not as scientific as you. But man, I They're can not. tell. I can tell some of them. Man was. A I've taught. Two people, these not all my secrets, but these. Yeah. And they're both hitting every they're both hitting good. Really? Oh yeah. Now the one I taught is in southern Utah and he taught our friends, our mutual friend in Australia how to do it. And when we started out knowing each other, it was many years ago, and they kept trying to teach me. But now they don't teach me anymore. And they have a different system than I do, and mm -hmm. I knew I had to stay with my system. Right, right. They had to stay with their system, but I corrected some of their frequencies, like I taught them things like you have to use the proton frequency, and then I taught them about the screen and a few things like that, but uh, I don't mind passing it. They're good people. I don't care if they go out and find a treasure. Yeah. I, I'm not going to be jealous of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> share and share alike. Yeah. And uh, I think the common people need to find more things. It'd be good for them. Yeah. You know, I got a a brother that's a he dredges for gold in rivers in Washington State. Been doing it for many years. He's a master at it. So is his son. And Washington and Oregon just outlawed that. So now the really? common the common people can't do it anymore. Oh man. So he's going to Idaho. Because it's still lawful there. Yeah. It's unlawful, I think, in California now. Yep. And so uh, it, it's sad because it's not hurting anybody. No. You know, I detected some veins of some plaster gold for him once in Washington State. I just took some of those rivers and I went over them and I marked them and sent them to him. And he looked at him and he says, Robert, I've been to those areas. They're all endangered species areas and protected oh, species areas. Really? But they were, I mean, one of those streams would probably have in a hundred foot area you'd probably have 20 pounds. Wow. They're very rich. That's, uh... And if you got, some people, he said, will put up a tent and they're just camping there. But what they've done is they've dug a tunnel underneath and they've tunneled underneath to get that gold. Huh? And he says, sometimes the tunnels cave in and they find their dead body. Oh, wow. That's how risky some treasure hunters are. Yeah. That's sad, but... A lot of gold in a lot of places. I wouldn't mind helping some of the miners and the people that plaster mine if they get a hold of me. I'd want, you know, some kind of a percentage or yeah, payment yeah, yeah. or something. You know, yeah. I don't, I'm not going to just give them my time right, forever right, right. and ever, you right, know. Yeah, your time's valuable. Yeah. Sure. But, uh, so that is one thing that's going on. And it's like, I think that to help people, that the common man can go out and a woman can go out and find values, you know, that's a wonderful thing. I just hope that all of them have discretion and wisdom and honesty and veracity and, and maturity so they won't dig up an ancient burial of wonderful yeah. artifacts and Dude, no, desecrate them or hurt them or harm them. Yeah. I would never endorse no, that. Me either. Oh, heavens to mercy. If I douse for somebody, and that's what I found, I'd give them their money back and not tell them where it was at. Why would I? 
I, I know one thing, and I found this out by experience. Academia is not on the side, in generally speaking, is not on the side of truth if it varies from what they believe, from their belief system, no less than a cult. Okay? I was the first person in history to have a forensic done on one of the Brewer plates. I remember you showed me that. Yeah. I took it to the academia and took it to BYU and showed it to them and I tell you, boy, they couldn't, it was like, it was like one of my doctors when I got over uh, blood cancer and I did. I did it myself and I had my blood tested and he says, Robert, he says, your blood is normal. I said, do you want to know how I did it, doc? And he said, no. I said, okay. I don't. I also got over diabetes. Mm -hmm. I had bad diabetes. Really? I completely got over it and I wanted to see my doctor. It was a different doctor because I quit going to the other one. He looked at my feet and he tested my blood and he says, Robert, you, you are well. I said, cool. I, I said, I know. Cool. So doctors make a lot of money. The medical profession makes a lot of money and I'm not against going to the doctor when I need one. I have many times. Yep. But I also know that we have to take responsibility ourselves, for ourselves, as much as we can. And doctors are like electricians or carpenters or anybody else. They make mistakes or there's pieces of knowledge that they don't have. Mm -hmm. So I harness all the knowledge and do all the research I can in any given situation where I need to so I can be more at cause and less at, at effect. And so, yeah, I, I cured diabetes and I also cured that and then I got hit with a lot of illnesses for about five years, but it woke me up because I struggled to survive and it caused me to study and learn and research more. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd heard that about you. I'd heard that you was very ill and they, people that told me didn't think you was going to make it. You're looking Most people good to did, me. didn't. You're looking pretty good to me. You know what kept me alive? What? I prayed a lot. You can be sure of that. I didn't want to leave my sweet little wife alone to pine away. I, uh, my biggest problem when I had congestive, congestive heart failure is I did spend about 600 hours in a hospital. Mm. But the biggest problem was, was not the congestive heart failure. They fixed that with an oblation. It's a little process where they stick a probe up your main artery and cauterize your heart. And that worked. But the biggest problem was they were giving me 12 different medications. And I didn't just react to them. I reacted really bad to them. Mm. I never knew whether I was going to pass out or have a seizure. And then I would get insomnia that would last at least 72 hours. I wouldn't sleep a week. Wow. And then I would get back to severe nausea and throwing up. And this went on day after day after day after day after day for month after month after month. Wow. And there was times I just wanted to die. Yeah. But I hung on. And I, I thanked the man upstairs. Amen. Well, I think I'm done. Galdana Terry, you just pulled out so much information from me. Did. What am I going to do? Robert, man, I appreciate it. With that said, that's a wrap, and thank you. You're welcome.